Hello, uh, this is uh, another uh, interview with our guest uh, Fishbowl 2 artist, uh, Rochelle Coulet Nielsen. And um, we're very excited to have Rochelle. Uh, as you know, the Fishbowl 2 display is um, at, located at 420 Northwest 9th Street uh, here in Portland, Oregon, uh, sponsored by the Blackfish Gallery. And uh, we like to encourage everyone to, you know, take a walk by and uh, take a look at this pretty dynamic uh, exhibit. Rochelle, let's let's start out by having you. I'd like for you to. I uh, how do you identify yourself? Let's start with that. I am a member of the Northwestern Band of Shoshone Nation, and my grandparents. Um, Linford and Margaret Neiman are from the Eastern Band and Western Band of Shoshone Nation. And my mother is Darlene Neiman, who is also, she's an Army veteran. An Army veteran, how many years? She served seven years. Oh, very good. Yes. Very good. Yes. The, um, the you know military experience in the native population is it seems to be rather synonymous for quite some time. We can go all mm -hmm. the way back to the early 1800s, I guess, yes. maybe further. <laughs> and that's pretty amazing. Thank you. you know, yes. You know, much in, in your artist statement, uh, much is made uh, about the uh, legacy of native schooling in the U.S. Um, and how formal education participated in the violence of settler colonialism. Uh, that's a quote from your, from your statement. Uh, mm -hmm. How did you arrive at that issue as your art practice platform? Um, I think, well, I didn't experience it personally, but it was my mother and all my aunties, my relatives, um, grandparents, great grandparents. It was, they, are the ones that experience that. And the result of the experience, especially for like my mother and her personal story was that when she was five, she they were forced to go to school. Um, fortunately, we did have a little school on our reservation and that they, the government forced all the children had to go to school and and it was a English school, a speaking school. And so they got to go to this little school and walk to school. But the, the influence and the treatment that was uh, given to them was very harsh. And it was, it, was, it was set up. The boarding schools were set up. To the the goal was to subjugate the indigenous uh, population and colonize their minds, mm -hmm. uh, not just minds, but bodies as well. And my mother was went in every no one really spoke English. And but my mother had no experience. And she went in as a five year old. And when she didn't understand the English command words, uh, she would ask her family members, what did they just say? What did she say? And when they were caught speaking the language, they would just hit them and spank them. And or they would have to write on the chalkboard a hundred times, I'm not an Indian. And I used to think that was just my family's, the, you know, the Shoshone Northwestern Band, our own story. But then it was it wasn't until I got into college and I started taking native classes that I discovered my story that it was not a I wasn't unique to the story of the history. It was all indigenous peoples and of color as well. And that's when I got my mom didn't really talk about it until I was in college and I asked her these questions and that was the first time she had talked about her experience in mm -hmm. um, her education through 12th grade and it was very harsh and yeah. it, it's, it's not... just I can't even imagine treating a little five-year-old that way they're babies mm -hmm. 
And so from there on, I was mad for a couple of years when I was learning this on undergrad school. I was mad. I was so upset about our history and why I had never learned any of this in history, right? When we go to school, we only hear about the, the conquer and their perspective. And so from there on, I thought that art has a way of um, telling a story and inviting people to face what history has done and what our history is in our perspective. Well, given your perspective on it, your historical perspective, first of all, thanks for sharing that. Um, so <laughs> this is an art interview, but however, we, we the politic can't be avoided, uh, mm -hmm. especially in this case, I don't think. So what do you think then of the current political climate to, um, to uh, repress or or just not talk about uh, past aggressions. I mean, how do we learn about each other if that be the case? Right. So it it takes someone to speak up. Mm -hmm. It takes um, a, a community to speak up and talk and about the events and mm -hmm. uh, and go to the education department and and ask. You know where. Right now, it's a big popular thing to be have equity, right? And so let's put that to uh, into place and make it happen. And so, mm, oh, I think it was like 20, my daughter's 25. So 20 years ago, I got involved in the Native Education Program here in Vancouver, Washington. And uh, five years after being in there, um, I started getting more involved and then I became the education coordinator and I served three school districts and I had learned so much and realized people don't even know the history. They don't know and understand the culture. And I think Hollywood is the one that perpetuates that, that we no break. longer exist. Yes. Yes. And, so, and because we don't stand out. We don't, we blend in and we're not wearing a regalia. So you're like, you can't ever say, oh, there's a native right there. Uh, we just blend in, but the culture is so strong in this community. And I would often have to go and speak on behalf of the students. Like some children had long hair, the boys have long hair and people would criticize him for that. The teachers would criticize him for that. There, there's just so many cultural differences. I would have to go and help and be this um, mentor, you know, uh, helping the teacher and the pre the principal and the students how to understand the culture, why they learn and how they learn differently. So I got really involved in that. And that's part of what I'm doing right now is trying to educate and have people acknowledge what our his true history is. We are pretending that it never existed, mm. but it did. And it, we, you know, America re, uh, built their land upon native land and are not recognizing that. And they forgot about that. How is that? Um reflected in the visual language of your art. Um, how did you, first of all, how did you arrive at that visual language? I'm particularly intrigued, uh, for example, uh, having listened to you, uh, the pieces uh, in, that utilize the upholstered chair, like mm -hmm. uh, what your mama didn't teach you, or uh, uh, no more uh, stolen sisters. So how did, how did you arrive at that visual language? I think, first of all, I teach at uh, Portland Community College uh, the, in the in Native Studies program. Hmm. And so I teach Intro to Native Studies and I teach Indigenous Art of U.S. and Canada. And I think it's that me that I am constantly involved in reading and learning and going to conferences and learning from all sorts of tribes. Um, around this area and it's a common theme that our voices aren't being heard and our stories aren't being heard and so as an artist 
I think we have that great impact that we can be influencers. And so I wanted to show and demonstrate history. So there, I just recently had a show and it was called What Your White Mama Didn't Teach You About Indians. I'm not making fun of the white mama. I'm really saying she can't teach you anything about Indians because she doesn't have that knowledge because it wasn't taught in school and it still isn't being taught in school. Yeah, and, and unfortunately, as it looks around the nation, we have a we have a handful of governors that are going to make sure that it's not taught in schools. Exactly. <laughs> we want to stay the good guy all the time. And mm. and that's not true. It's mm. not, you know, government politics, it hides things from us that we um are we shouldn't know, but it's happening all the time. And and I tell my students if this happens to native indigenous people and of color, it's gonna happen to you too, because that's just how it's set up. I feel like it's corrupt and it's hidden, the things that we yes. should know about. Right, yes. Well, obviously you're preaching to the choir on this one. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it, 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 it is. We been, know this. <laughs> yes, yes, we do. And it, it, you know, oftentimes I get the question and I'll be curious uh, to get your response to this. I often get the question of why I continue to focus on the subjects that I focus on in my own art. And uh, in, in that it just simply, uh, it just simply ag further agitates uh, the race relation waters. Um, yeah, what's, what's your take on a statement like that? We have, uh, we have to continue to make these types of art until it makes changes. Mm. We keep doing it because it's not changing and people forget. We have like amnesia, you know, uh, and I am guilty of that. I have amnesia too, right? I'll, there's an event that happened and it's like I've forgotten about it. like 9-11, I know how devastating that is. I know the story, but it's kind of like I removed myself from that and I have amnesia. I forgot about it. I'm now focusing on something else. And I think we have to keep doing this until the change happens. Mm. Very good. Ex excellent point. Well, back to, back to your image list. Um, but first of all, those are incredibly compelling uh, uh, pieces of work. I, I Thank really you. compliment you on that. Um, it's been a while since I've since I personally have seen um, um, what the conceptual conceptual uh, approaches around very important, very complex ideas. And I often am curious about the journey of arriving at that visual language. So I, I have to come back to the chair. <laughs> so take, take me through that. Um, how did you come to that item as representation of the issues we've been discussing so far? Well, I had the opportunity to meet uh, Jean Quick to see Smith, um, oh, one of my favorite artists. We definitely want to mine too. Yes. Yeah. And she came and did a visit, visit um, a studio visit. And she's the one that said, Rochelle, you need to keep pushing yourself and tell the story. And she's the one that said, Rochelle, I think you should do a show called What Your White Mama Didn't Tell You, tell you About Indians. So this was like... <laughs> Six, she's so, the one i oh, haven't emailed her yet and i gotta send it to her say here i did it uh, she's the one that gave me the idea so i can't say i came up with it but i was intrigued and i thought uh, the title itself is intriguing it's kind of like a oh you know we get to laugh at it because it's like uh, you know i find that most people who are of color laugh at the the title like oh my gosh that's so brazen of you and so bold um but at the same time I've been known as like a trickster and I was really offended by a friend who said Rochelle you're a trickster and I 
was offended by that. I was like, I'm not a trickster. I'm, I don't do that. But mm. then I realized I am one. I like a trickster doesn't mean that we are trying to make your life miserable. We like to challenge your thinking and the way you think. Mm. And so that is where that whole concept came from. But again, like I was telling you that I'm teaching and that has a huge influence. And I always am thinking of ways how I can cre create work and art pieces based on history. And so I'll look for images, um, you know, especially the ones that have been taken in the 1800s. There's a lot of, and those are their images and, and also 1900s that I take that, those images from and then translate it into my um, compositions in my work. So are you saying that the Edward Curtis photographs are really <laughs> of the native experience? <laughs> It's okay. You don't it's have... a prop. It's a prop. That's what a... I'm going to say. Okay. That's pretty good. And for, for those who are listening, uh, Juan Quintessie Smith is one of the preeminent um, Native American contemporary artists in America who happens to be a resident of the Pacific Northwest. Mm -hmm. um, very good. Um, have you uh, gained familiarity with, let's talk about some other preeminent Native voices, art voices, uh, for example, James Lavador? Mm hmm Yes. Yeah. Um, how how do you or do you see any connection between where he is with his philosophy? Though the visuals, granted, are only he you he leverages the the um, the landscape uh, the landscapes of yeah. which he's on. But uh, I feel that the philosophy, the point, is pretty much in line with what your point behind your work is am i am, am i wrong i think we yeah i absolutely love his work too and i think it, it's all about connection with our spirituality mm. and how we integrate our culture in the landscape and i think he does a really good job doing that and representing indigenous people and the way we are connected to the earth connected to the land and i feel that same way i i feel when i make pieces i'm being a voice for my ancestors i need to tell their stories i think that's why i am compelled to do the work because they've passed on and no one is who's being the voice for them and I want to make that change and be that voice for ancestors and when I make work I feel that connection sometimes I feel like I hear them say oh wait put this in there mm -hmm. or I don't know what to do with this I and then I'll just I will take a moment in silence and then I will ask what they want they're, how do how do they want their voices to be heard and what do they want me to do and and then I just make it your uh, students are uh, you're again you're the adjunct professor at uh, Portland Community College uh, your mm -hmm. students how do they express themselves um, around these ideas because uh, surely I'm, I'm I'm assuming it's an assumption so correct me that uh, you are bringing your philosoph your philosophies into your teaching practice to them mm -hmm. um, when they have their opportunity to uh, to reflect or to demonstrate um, visually um, what they are uh, thinking be it writing or be it or be it images uh, what what seems to be the more a frequent common mode of expression? Um, I believe most are, I feel anger for them. Mm. They're angry about the school system. They're angry that why did, why does it take this long for us to learn about these, your culture when this could have been taught all along from grade school? And there was a, po a part that I, I read, I don't, can't remember where I read it at, but it, it stated that, it stated that, where was I going to go with this? 
Oh, it'll come back to me. It was right there in my mind. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we, but we all I feel like they have a they are angry. They are so upset that they waited that long. Oh, I know what it is. If indigenous children had to start bo boarding schools and learn English and go through trauma, why can't the white children learn about that trauma at that mm -hmm. same age? Tell them to hold on to that question because, uh, as I said, that is seems to be the the one thing that is driving politics and the social politics in America today, uh, and that is preventing that mm -hmm. from happening. Mm -hmm. Excellent questions. I, mm -hmm. I the best in exploring that outcome. Mm -hmm. uh, going going back uh, to your to your work again. Uh, um, the MMW piece, take me through that one. Uh, well, uh, the, the acronym stands for Missing, Murdered, and Indigenous, Missing and Murdered, murdered indigenous, indigenous Women, right. Yeah. Take me so through that. I, um, so Missing Indigenous Women, we're finally making a head headline and we have never been supported. And what's happening is on most reservations, there are, you know, there's fracking, there's something going on. And that's why we're always trying to protect our, the lands. Uh, because what happens is these workers, you know, after work, they're in the middle of nowhere. And then they go into to the reservation and they're, it's a huge problem. They're kidnapping, they're, uh, you know, assaulting our women and two spirit and girls and nobody's doing anything and because it's happening on the reservation that the fbi won't get involved but this year biden did do something and he he uh, passed a a uh what do you call it a policy that the fbi now can get involved in the on the reservations and prosecute those people that are doing the harm for missing indigenous women and uh but it has always been a long history since colonialism came you know it's since the settlers columbus right he wrote in his journal how he made more money off nine and ten year old girls and selling them than he could slaves mm -hmm and or adults and so it started then you know kidnapping our our women and our mm -hmm. girls and our children and so today what i love about social media these young adults are making a huge impact and sending out their voices and telling the story and there's uh, so many organizations in every state um who are trying to support missing indigenous women. And we are not like make, we're like trying to have a voice on that and in media and making statements to make a difference and help find those, those women. And I have a really good friend, Jerry Muma, who has an organization in Seattle and she herself was the victim and she got out when she was 19. She had been sold and trafficked. And amazing story that she has. And when she was able to get her voice back, she started the organization and mm -hmm. working with um, the government and trying to make movements for things to happen and to get more involved. Because you, as you know, when it comes to women or men in color and the same result happens to white women, the white women get like the, the attention, the media and media gets involved. But when it happens to us, nothing happens. So mm. we have to be loud and we have lots of political leaders, indigenous leaders who are speaking up about this problem that's not we're not being supported well it is a problem uh, personally i can ex i can speak to that problem mm -hmm. but I, my grandmother actually talking about that issue in many of the conversations 
she and I had. My grandmother was was half a shock Choctaw Indian. Choctaw, yes. And uh, a lot of what she, a lot of those conversations have found its way into my own work. Uh, but I'm long been intrigued by the fact that most Americans don't realize that native uh, reservations are uh, sovereign soil. And um, that can be a good thing, but it's often been exploited uh, in that crimes get committed uh, on the reservations. And it's a, it's a lot like the old days of the US, let's say where uh, a crime was committed in one state, if you made it across the border to the next state, you're free. You were, yes, yes. And that's pretty much how it is when it comes yeah. to the reservations. Yeah. And it's interesting that that my point being is it's interesting that that situation to me has persisted as long as it has when we've already as a nation had to come to grips with with that problem. And we took action by uh, federally uh, declaring activities as being, uh, you know, criminal acts that can be pursued across borders. Mm -hmm. I guess if you had more banks and if those banks were being robbed, that might help. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's pretty funny. Well, so I'm assuming then that the chair figure in that piece, um, Missing Murdered Indigenous Women, the fact that it's empty is the, is the representation point. Mm -hmm. Am I wrong? No, you're right. Mm -hmm. You're absolutely right. Fabulous. Absolutely fabulous. Um, let's see where we are. I had one more question for you. Oh, I know what it was. So can you tell me what is next for uh, Rochelle in terms of the work? Um, what do you, how do you see it evolving? I feel like the that I want my this the which a white mama didn't teach you about Indians um, to evolve in going to academic settings. I want mm -hmm. them to go into galleries and universities, academics, so that because it's about education, and I'd like to challenge the system and bring still continue to talk about this the, the history of indigenous um people and i want to see that happen but i also am really involved in have a series of abstract paintings landscape paintings and they're all of uh, wyoming so and that's where my tribe originated near way in wyoming but on yellowstone park where is, is where we did all our medicine gathered at um, our medicines, hunting, did our ceremonies there. And then when it was declared a, a, you know, a national park, well, then we became an inconvenience that, to the visitors and the visitors complained. And so then they kicked us off our own area to, to have ceremonies and we no longer could attend there any longer. So hmm. I go there and I'll, I've taken all my own photos. I don't like to use other photographers work. So I've gone there and took, have taken my own pictures so I can create my own landscapes. I like to do beadwork into my um, paintings and uh, incorporate, the, incorporate that material of traditional way of creating. And, and so that's one of the things I'm, I really am interested in as well as these abstract paintings. I've seen that quite a bit in the, in abs, in paintings created by uh, native people, uh, incorporating the beadwork uh, into that. The significance of the bead. Can you talk about that for a minute? Well, the beadwork actually it's it was introduced maybe there's a record maybe late 1600s. But it wasn't really part of our everyday, that wasn't our traditional way of making things. Um, it was using porcupine quails and different uh, types of grasses or pine needles and things. And uh, so we didn't really have the beads until it was traded. And so I just want to kind of say that traditional and contemporary kind of a misnomer, we've always adapted 
new materials by trade and say, hey, I like that. And I really would rather cook in on a on a pan than the what we're using right now. Let's incorporate that something that is faster, right? I mean, we're always in inventive and bringing in new things. And so beading is something that I didn't learn how to do until I was in my 20s. And uh, I didn't learn, have my language. I didn't have the native storytelling. I didn't have like this knowledge of um, traditional, you know, materials that I would use. I didn't learn any of those things. Um, it wasn't until in my 20s that I started asking my mom and then she started incorporating and teaching. Um, it was just a beautiful thing and a beautiful experience that she finally got felt comfortable and unafraid to teach us all the culture of what she knew, how to make, how to be, how to create moccasins, how to dance, how to um, then speak the language. All I know in when I was a young child was all the command words. And so I always thought I was a great kid, but then I reflected back and like, um, I always was told to be quiet, sit still, <laughs> listen, you don't have ears. And I'm like, hmm, I don't know. I think I maybe challenged my mom. <laughs> Why do I just know those words? <laughs> just did. Yeah, that brings to mind uh, the um, the article I, I read last week in uh, Art in America. On the title was on uh, the authenticity of Native American art, and the uh, the author was uh, well, he was trying to make it was a he and he was trying to make a point about uh, how uh, much has been appropriated from the uh, native language and being uh, and being passed off today as uh, the authentic voice. Um, interesting, what, what do you think of that? Um, I think I'll have to think about that one for a while. That's a, that's a really good statement. I, I'll have to think about that one. I don't have an answer right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Well, that, that brings us to the end of the interview. And Rochelle, I really totally enjoyed it. Thank you, it. Eddie. And, and those, again, who are listening, um, Rochelle's work is in, our, uh, is in Blackfish Gallery's Fishbowl 2 uh, project, which is on display at 420 Northwest 9th Street here in Portland. And we obviously would like to encourage everyone to stop by, take a look, and um, you know, venture an opinion. Uh, you know, it's important work, and we're very pleased to host it. So, Rochelle, th you know, thank you again. Thank you. I appreciate it. Bye-bye. Oh. <laughs>